Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. Joining me today again is Nikolai Herman. Hi, everyone. And uh, we have a new co-host who's going to be joining us from this episode onwards. And that's Alison Lewis. Hey, Alison. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali. Thanks for the introduction. And I'm a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. And I'm excited to join the podcast. I'm a longtime podcast listener and new podcast creator, I guess. Woot, woot. Yeah, it's great to have you here. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here with us. And uh, let's make some good podcasts together. Speaking of good podcasts, I think today's episode is a spicy one. What do you guys think? Yes, so uh, with Elizabeth Big, like with the work she does on misconduct, it's going to be interesting to hear her side of the story. Yeah, um, exactly. So have you guys heard about the concept of scientific misconduct before? I mean, at, a, at our institute, we had to do like a scientific integrity misconduct training course to kind of learn about what it is and why papers might get retracted and what is good scientific practice. But I think I've been pretty lucky that I haven't actually seen it myself in my short scientific career as a PhD student or in my master's in Canada. So, yeah. yeah. What about you, Nico? Yeah, I haven't come across it uh, myself so far. Um, but I mean, since I followed Elizabeth Big on Twitter, I've seen like that it can be actually m happen more often. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's true. What about you? Yeah, so I think uh, I came across a couple of papers, like a friend of mine was showing me a paper about uh, this uh, like paper where they had done crazy amounts of image manipulation and blacked out portions of the whole images and sort of made sure that the only thing that you were seeing was like, it was like they'd made pixels which looked very much obviously like pixels in the graph and also very much obviously like like dots in an image and these were like clear manipulation and this paper got retracted as well. So I've come across this before, but I do not have the, I mean, luckily I do not have the experience of seeing it firsthand. So that's good as well. I mean, that's, cr that's crazy. Like that seems like a pretty extreme example though to actually add pixels. I guess oh, yeah. like it can probably be much more benign. I mean, I know I've talked to uh, professors in the past who consider like changing the levels, even if it's to the whole image to like, make background bands look less noticeable even when you apply it to everything is like image manipulation, like mm -hmm. a, a gel should be published as you acquired it. Yeah. So some people are really strict. That's true. I mean, that is one way to prevent image manipulation. But of course, I think sometimes when you take microscopy images, you kind of need them to pop in some way. So I think applying it to the whole image makes sense, but to certain parts of the image to enhance it, I think that is where the line is more or less drawn these days. Anyway, I think if we start chatting about it, we keep talking about it for very long. So let's go on to the discussion with Dr. Elizabeth Big and see what she has to say about this whole topic, which is, of course, her field of expertise. Yeah, looking forward to it. Welcome to the seventh episode of Upstream Magazine, the podcast, Dr. Big. We're ha very happy to have you with us here today. So uh, we just want to start off by asking you how you got to where you are and how all this uh, started for you. So I started to become interested in science misconduct a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2013, 14. And I first started uh, working on plagiarism and then later I found out I have some talent for discovering duplicated images in scientific papers. And, and I did all of that as a, as a, as a strange hobby uh, besides my full-time job. Uh, I worked at Stanford at the time. And so um, then I worked also two years in, in biotech. But uh, about one and a half years ago, I decided I wanted to do science misconduct work full-time. So I quit my job and I'm now doing that as a as a science volunteer i guess unpaid oh 
Okay, yeah. but uh, just to start off, you had a career in science already. So yes. you did your PhD as far as I remember, and then yeah, okay, and you I mean you also you also worked for fifteen years in science. Uh, what exactly did you was your topic? Um, so I, I worked longer in science, but I worked 15 years at Stanford and I worked on the microbiome of humans and marine mammals. So which the bacteria, the bacterial communities that um, that animals and plants carry uh, in and on them. And I worked on I specialized in, in human microbiome of the mouth and of the gut. Uh, but it, I also worked with the U.S. Navy on a project characterizing the microbiome of dolphins. Oh, so oh wow. Really cool. Okay, and then uh, in the last, so after you quit your job, now you're a science consultant. Mm -hmm. And are you working just unpaid or are you still working on another job on the side then? So I'm, I'm the work I do that is visible for other people, the work I post on Twitter and on my blog, that is all unpaid. I do an occasional job here and there as a consultant, so that is paid. Uh, I've worked for some uh, institutions, for some uh, universities uh, across the world, and I've done some work for publishers. But it's 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 usually sparse. Most of the work I do is unpaid. And this, okay, so you, but all of that work is connected to scientific misconduct. Correct. Okay. So, and then maybe, do you want to tell us how you got into uh, scientific misconduct? I mean, you were mentioning it a bit already. But uh, yeah, you said it started out as a hobby. Like, how, what was the first time? Like, I think it's not the most uh, natural thing to track down other no. people that do wrong, right? <laughs> well, I, I don't really want to make it about tracking down people. I want to <laughs> okay, make yes. it about tracking down tracking down papers because I yeah, it's not a man hunt or a woman hunt. It's uh, tracking down bad papers and flagging them so that other people don't waste their time trying to replicate them. Um, but yeah, it's it's it started just by reading about science misconduct and sort of becoming gradually interested in that. There's blog posts uh, like like uh, there's Retraction Watch, and you can read about like, how papers get retracted. And I think some of these stories are just very interesting and juicy. <laughs> they're you know they're almost like detective stories, right? They're interesting, and so they're. Uh, I started just reading about plagiarism, and I just thought for. For, for fun, let's just put a sentence that I wrote in a review paper I'd written the, in what are, a couple of years previously. Let's just take my sentence and put it between quotes into Google Scholar. And I found a hit, not just with my own paper, but with another paper. So that uh, made me mad because I had written the paper and somebody else had it and uh, had stolen it, basically. So I, I got hooked and started working for a year on plagiarism. And then um, I, by accident, discovered a duplicated image in a PhD thesis that I was working on that had plagiarized text. And that image was duplicated, but it had also been published in a scientific paper. And so that got me interested in duplicated images. And I just started searching for these duplication, duplicated images in scientific papers, and I just picked plus one because it's a nice journal to go online and to browse for images. So I just opened a bunch of, of papers, looked for photographic images in mainly in Western blots um, and, and microscopy photos. And that first evening I already found a couple of examples. And then I just became completely fascinated and hooked. And I started doing that, you know, every three minute I had, I started looking for duplicated images and And then it turned into a science project because I'm a scientist and a nerd. And I thought, okay, I need to do this in a scientific way, not just do it for, 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 for fun, but like I need to do something with this. And I decided to, you know, look at the prevalence of these things. How often do we find these papers in scientific journals and, and uh, these, these, these images in scientific papers? And I, uh, yeah, started doing that and uh, it turned into, to a big project, I scanned 20,000 papers for that project and found about 4%, so eight, 800 papers to contain duplicated images. What are the different forms of misconduct that you usually come across? Because you, you already mentioned duplicated images and plagiarism, but are there different forms of misconduct that you come across on a regular basis? 
Right. Well, for me, duplicated images are the most common kind because they're so visible, right? It's very hard to find misconduct if it's well done in a table or a line graph. Like I can be, I cannot really detect if there's fabricated data in there. But in a photo, I can see the duplications. And I, um, I, I also want to point out that if I, if I spot a duplicated image, that's not necessarily science misconduct. It can be an honest error. Uh, somebody just inserted the same photo twice. And that happens if, if, if you have tons of panels in a scientific paper and they're, you didn't label them very, very nicely on your you know, server or your, your, you know, your, your thumb drive when you took the microscopy photos. It happens that by accident, the same photo gets inserted twice. But I'm... Uh, so I'm flagging those papers, but I know that this could be an honest error. But if the image is rotated or flipped or shifted, that means that it might have been done intentionally. So that is that is maybe misconduct, but it's it's up to the journals and institutions to in, investigate and, and um, make that judgment call. I just flagged that these are duplicated photos. Uh, and then on the other hand, I've also seen papers where people seem to have used false affiliations that's by itself technically that's not misconduct but it's it's shady you know i can write a paper and put a harvard affiliation on it even though i don't work at harvard and of course that's going to make my paper look much better than uh if i'm unemployed right but um it's so if you use a false affiliation it, that's definitely not good and has some legal implications um so i found those i've seen I have seen duplicated correlation plots across different papers. So people use the same plot. Uh, they just copy the plot for somewhere else, or maybe they have bought the paper from the same company because there's companies selling papers. So I just by starting looking at duplicated images, I found this whole other range of things that are wrong with scientific papers that I uh, uh, sometimes, you know, write, write a blog post about and can also be lack of, lack of consent, like, there were there was a you know uh, there was just a paper that got retracted where uh, I think gynecologists looked at the attractiveness of women and then correlated that with with um, I think endometriosis and that the women <laughs> <laughs> I know you're laughing but it's it's you I'm know <laughs> you go you go to the doctor to to discuss your I don't know your a, a problem with with you know your your lady parts and then. Uh, somebody takes a photo and uses it without your consent to judge your attractiveness. That's just wrong because the patients didn't give consent for that. Um, they did not. And so, uh, as far as I know, I, I don't know the details. I wasn't involved with that, but there, there's just outrageous papers out there. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, they make you laugh, but it is. It, it, I always say there's a sad story behind every every paper that we discuss because it is. It is. Yeah, I mean. It is good to see the humor in it, and I, I try to do it. But man, these cases are just these are insane. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when there's so much. I mean, I don't know if that's intentional malice, or it seems malicious in general. I mean, it seems very yeah. intentional. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't mean they don't. They maybe not intend malice to the person, but it it does end up becoming malicious to the people. Then this yeah. is just. But someone exactly. has to be very careful about, it, especially right. if you if it's something scientific. Mm -hmm. And I, I, at least I I don't I, I don't know, but in at least for us when we had when we started the PhDs, all of us had to go through this good scientific practices training right. courses, and we had to we had to write an exam about this where we had to, and we had to talk to a person who used to grill us on different types of like how authorship works and how mm -hmm. uh, images work and what how, what uh, what kind of editing is uh, permitted on images and what kind mm -hmm. of editing is not permitted and we had a workshop on this and we had people training us about this as well that's that's and, great yeah <laughs> and i kind of feel if people didn't go through this perhaps it's probably it's easier for them to fathom that what they're doing is maybe not or or maybe they they may think that they're not doing misconduct by mm -hmm altering certain things in certain ways. I mean, like in the last uh, or recent uh, years, you have been basically mainly focusing on images, right? Uh, right. So what were the most uh, prevalent uh, types of misconduct, I guess, you found? So just like image duplications, as you mentioned before, or actually people manipulating images? 
I found I found all all across that spectrum. Um, and again, it's not up to me to judge if it's misconduct. I, I just see duplication. So I specialize in duplications. So if an image has been manipulated, I cannot actually tell that if it's done well. Like uh, anybody can do a good Photoshop and, and you wouldn't really be able to tell that. But if there's duplicated parts and, and an analogy would be, you know, those photos at, let's say, a presidential inauguration where people have been Photoshopped in. And it's usually that they take other parts of the audience and sort of copy paste that multiple times. And so you see the same, you know, group of people multiple times in the same photo. So duplications are fairly easy for the human eye brain <laughs> combination to, to detect. So that is what I do. And I've seen the equivalent of that, um, of the Photoshopped audiences in uh, cell microscopy or tissue microscopy, where the same tissue structure or the same, uh, the same, uh, a photo of, of, of a cell, the same part of a cell is, is just duplicated uh, multiple times. So that's that's just, uh, yeah, one of the examples. Uh, I've seen duplicated Western blots or duplicated bands within Western blots. Um, uh, and, and another one that I seem to have an eye for is, is uh, flow cytometry plots, where parts of the, the dots that you see, these plots are duplicated either within the same plot or across plots. So it's, 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 yeah. So these are technically not photos, but I do see a mis uh, yeah, what I assume is misconduct in, in those photos. I mean, these are very intentional, I would say, right? I mean, this is not an image you get. Yes, I mean, it, exactly. It's, uh, although the author will, will tell you that um, it, it, it was some mistake in the machine or we didn't clean the machine or there's always an excuse um, and they, they usually try to dazzle me with like technical terms. I'm like, this is just, this is just bullshit. <laughs> this is just manipulated. Like I cannot. So occasionally I will take things to Twitter and I will ask like, yeah. is this, is this bullshit or, uh, I think it's bullshit, but I actually don't know much about, uh, you know, about, about, um, uh, the technique to, to really mm -hmm. know, uh, if, if it is bullshit, but I'm, you know, my gut feeling just says this is, this is crap. So, uh, so my next question is along the same lines. Uh, do you think the, that w the misconduct is somehow deep rooted in science because of the way science is done? Is there right. is there something deep that people are following, mm -hmm. which is making them commit these uh, scientific misdeeds? Um, so misconduct is everywhere. It's not just in science. It's in, uh, I usually give the examples of financing, like banking and uh, construction are two examples where there have been big scandals. So people are doing bad things everywhere. That, so it's, it's not unique to science. I don't think science is better or worse than any other profession uh, or field. Um, but I think in science, as of now, we're so focused on our outputs, on our publications, on on the impact factor of our publications. So everything turns around how many papers did you publish this year? And that number might be different from if you're a postdoc, maybe you would expect to be that to be one. But if you're a professor, that needs to be, I don't know, 10. And if you if you don't get those numbers uh, across different years, then you might lose your job. And um that is true for all scientists on all levels. And, and so we're very pushed towards publishing papers and also outcomes need to be positive. A negative result is not really regarded to be suitable for a paper, even though it, it's years of work and it might be valuable for another person. So there's, there's just many things inherently uh, baked in the structure of science that, that make people do misconduct because we need that paper. And so maybe if we we just want to get out of the lab maybe and then we just have that one positive result and that gives us a step up to our next step in our career but then it becomes easier to do it another time right like uh once you've had a successful paper that was maybe based on honor science and the next project like everybody expects then great things of you after your first i don't know nature paper uh which i've never had but like if you if you had a nice paper with nice results and then you get this re very prestigious job, um, then people expect you to do similar great results and maybe then your new research doesn't work that well. And so then it just becomes easier to cheat over time 
And there's just many structures that that allow people to do that. And the punishment in science are also pretty much non-existent. I've had a couple of cases seen where people then were not allowed to publish in a paper in a particular journal, or they weren't allowed to to apply for certain grants for a couple of years. But it's really most people just keep their jobs, and and the university looks the other way. The journals. It's like a slap on the wrist. Uh, almost nothing, like a, a, a tiny little, <laughs> you know, not even a slap. <laughs> yeah, there's almost nothing that happens. And and often it's actually the junior people, the, the postdocs and the, the graduate students who were desperate to get out of a, of a bad lab that, uh, and were almost, you know, forced or encouraged by their PI to do this. They are the one who will lose their jobs. And, 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 and the whole structure in academia in that respect is, is so based on, hierarchy so you know the boss will will write our letter of recommendation and so we have to be nice and we cannot criticize him or her and um yeah so yeah there's there's you know a lot of things wrong in academia still i love science and uh would, would not have chosen any any other way if i could do it again but yeah there's just things we need to discuss and things we can do better as scientists I mean, do you see any of these structures emerging nowadays? Uh, I have to admit, I, I don't know of anything in that direction at all that is trying to tackle scientific misconduct. Uh, so I feel like something that you're doing is quite, uh, yeah, uh, like you're just one person that does it. And yeah, that's... Uh, An add-on to his question is, do you think there's something that people can do before they commit misconduct or... Because what you're doing is after they publish as well. And right. so this is when they've already committed the mm -hmm. committed their scientific misconduct. But right. is, there, is there something that one can do to, or a check or a balance that one can do before they do this or in, in the process, during the process? It's, it's tough because I think everything um, is dependent on the atmosphere in a lab. So it's, uh, you know, you can, you can give all the classes you you want to graduate students to not do misconduct but if your pi creates an atmosphere in the lab that forces you almost to do misconduct otherwise you will be fired then you are in a very dependable situation and you might do it even though you know it's wrong you just feel like this is i i need this for my career i need this for my salary i need this to support my family or um yeah to get to get my next job and uh so it, we, I don't think we can prevent it at all or like, you know, there will always be bad people. But I think having, working on the atmosphere in a lab is for me an important thing that has not really been addressed. Like there's toxic labs in all institutions and most labs are great, uh, but, you know, there's just some bad apples. And um, how can we... How can we make universities address those problems in a more constructive way? And and I think the tide is slowly changing. It's it's just a very slow process, and it's similar to other movements um, of a of a much bigger scale. I don't want to compare science misconduct with, uh, for example, sexual harassment, but uh, or you know the the things that police in the U.S. do wrong to. Uh, to black people, but there's there's a lot of different movements in the past couple of years that are inspired by social media, where I feel there is a change that that is slowly getting there, but it, it's going to take decades of work. and And I'm not the on, only person doing this type of work. There's many many others. Um, I'm fairly visible because I use my own name, but there's many other people behind the scenes that are doing similar work and do not want to you know, step up and, and, and reveal who they are. But it's, it's, there's teams of people, but it's all rogue people like me, unpaid. We do this unpaid and we try to have a seat at the table of the, the, the institutions and the, the boards and the committees. But so far we have not really been part of that, but I think it will change over time. Uh, I, I feel I'm doing, I'm doing something honorable, I hope. Um, but I, yeah, I hope, that that will be recognized and that that I can make a little little bit of change in science. No, that is very much true. I mean, 
Okay, now I didn't know that actually there were more people in this. I mean, you're the most visible one, definitely, I would say. Sure. And uh, would you say that, or do you get like personal attacks? Because you said you're using your own name while other people are actually not. So does this happen often? And if, how do you deal with it? Um, in the beginning, I would post things online anonymously. I would, I've always written to journals and institutions under my full name. But when I posted things on Pubpeer, which is a site where you can uh, post these comments, I usually did it under uh, a pseudonym, and so an, an, an anonymous account. But over time, I felt a little bit more confident. And I've also learned just from corresponding to the journals how to word things and not get myself in trouble. That's like I've... I have so far been able to avoid any big trouble. I've had some attacks. People have called me nasty things and sent me nasty emails. So those were not fun to deal with, but they're they're so far they were just words and but I'm yeah, I'm trying to always be careful in my wording like I say said in the beginning like I don't want to make it about the persons. I want to make it about the papers. But it, yeah, sometimes these things are tied together and so it's 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 um uh, it's tough to criticize somebody's work without criticizing the person who did it. Um, but I, I try not to, not to attack that person. And I try to remain as objective as I can just stating the facts like, and, and for me, it's a fact that, you know, figure two, a looks like figure three B is just, you know, they're very similar. I had not expected these to look so similar. Can you explain it? Uh, and that, that's a different wording than what other people say, like misconduct, fraud, and, you duplicated that image. That's a very different, uh, different way of phrasing it. And and the first one will uh, hopefully get me, you know, not into trouble. While the second one would get me into trouble very fast. And uh, especially in the U.S., where people will sue you for pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so far, uh, knock on wood, I have not had any legal trouble. But I, as as I'm. Uh, you know, I have a, a large amount of people who support me now, so I feel a little bit more confident sometimes in saying saying some strong using some stronger words. And uh, yeah, I hope I've I've created a little bit more support for what I've been doing. But um, but again, it's 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 lots of other people make this work possible, like the people behind Papier, the people behind Retraction Watch. Uh, uh, there's many others who have done this work before me, like Paul Brooks and Claire Francis, which is a pseudonym. And those are people who have done very similar work and sort of, uh, I, I feel I'm just standing on their shoulders. They, they have, they have, uh, enabled me to do this work, but, but yeah, I, I, I've decided to go a little bit more public with it and, and to make, uh, it also in an attempt to shine the light on other people. But because they're usually, uh, most of them are anonymous, at least the people who do this, this type of work that I'm doing, I cannot really name their names. Uh, I don't even know their names. I just know their pseudonyms. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a team effort for sure. So you mentioned that, uh, that you directly contact the journals about these things. Right. So uh, how do the journals respond when you contact them and tell them that this is something which I found in your publication? Um, well, I just wrote a blog post about that yesterday, so I'm laughing. Uh, I don't get a lot of responses, unfortunately, and it's getting a little bit better. So now, so when, when I write to journals, often journals don't even send me an acknowledgement that they've gotten it. It, it, it depends per journal. But if it's a smaller journal, um, they usually don't have a contact address they just list the editor-in-chief and so i uh, but they don't list their email address so i need to hunt them down and if it's just you know um, s johnson in new york there's not much to work with for me so i cannot really you know where are they working what is their institute what's their email so i cannot even contact some journals at all uh that's just the smaller journals and but yeah and Sometimes they do send me a receipt saying, sure, sure, we'll, we'll work on this. And then I check in a year later, uh, you know, it's been a year, what's up? It's, it's me again, uh, you know, have you done something? And then they don't, they don't usually respond to that email at all. And then, you know, it's just, as we call it here, crickets, like nothing happens. You just hear the sound of crickets. <laughs> 
So it's uh, I've re- the, the set of papers that I've reported in 2014 and 15. So it's almost five years ago, uh, the last paper of that set. There was a set of 800 papers, and only only one third of those papers have been corrected or retracted. Two thirds are untouched. So just tells you that journals are not really taking any action. So to this day, they are still online. Uh, they're still like online. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. Nothing happened. So I'm I'm slowly adding all of these uh, onto Papier. So I'm, I'm a lot of the uh, yeah. So some 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 of the things I post on Papier are actually things I reported five years ago already. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna put it up here because I want people to see that this paper has a potential problem. And so don't base your whole career on this one paper because it might not be true. So you mentioned that. Uh... The, so some journals they either so they do retractions or they let the authors correct the manuscripts later on. But uh, how do you, what all what other things can journals do? Because like correcting a manuscript after it's published is is like giving them a second chance because you know you right. expect that it's an honest mistake that they have made. Mm-hmm. But if it's, let's say, like a repeat offender or something like that, so is there something that journals can do or certain types of actions that journals take when they do take action? Um, yeah, so um, it's almost like if they take action because they don't really take a lot of action. But the, there are several things a journal can do. So the, the And, and it, it all depends on the type of error. So if it's an honest error, let's say the simple duplicated photo that is just used twice, um, I think a correction would be good. But if it's, you know, let's say six duplicated photos in a paper, then you start to wonder, you know, that that's just sloppy. Like, you know, if you, if you, maybe all the other papers, all the other photos in that paper are mislabeled too. If you're that sloppy, then uh, maybe you should retract the paper. So um, an editor would normally contact the author and then give the author an ex, you know a chance to explain what happened. It must was maybe an honest error or it was intentional. Now, an author will usually not admit that it was intentional. So, even if it was, you know, just looking at a photo, like completely photoshopped, it's always an, they will always claim it was some error. Uh, either the work was outsourced or they just gave the, the gel or the tissue sample to a graduate student or an intern. Like somebody gets the blame, but it was never them. And um, so you just, I don't know. It's, it's, and it's hard. Some editors just accept these lame excuses. And then it will become a correction. So I've seen some corrections for papers that, in my opinion, had photoshopped images, like clearly duplicated parts. And and then they'll just say, oh, just, you know, send in a new photo. And I think that's wrong. But um, I cannot really complain other than complaining it online and awarding it my uh, award of, um, you know, editors who, who didn't make the right decision. Um, and then other editors will really try to do the, the right thing, contact the authors, but the authors don't respond, which is another sort of an impossible situation because then this this thing, this case is just not resolved and it just stays there. Uh, but there are, there are options for editors. Uh, good editors should slap immediately uh, an expression of concern on such a paper. They can do that without uh, really starting an investigation. When things are so obvious, then an editor can put that and they they can still do an investigation and then either later retract the expression of concern or turn it into a retraction. Um, There's many options, but uh, that option is not used a lot and I think it should be used much more often. Um, But the, the real problem is that where I think something is obviously manipulated, the editor might not agree with that, and uh, whether maybe maybe they really agree with it, but they have a lot of pressure from their publisher to not address it. And there's so many conflicts of interest, and um, yeah, it's 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 frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I keep on I keep on doing it and smiling and and laughing about it, and and uh, yeah, now at least <laughs> I can post things on a on a blog post or on Twitter and and have other people. Uh, hopefully agree with me and and sometimes other people didn't agree i'm like okay maybe i'm too strong and uh so i'm I'm learning from that but i'm i'm getting a little bit more confident in that what i'm seeing is truly 
wrong and should be addressed. And there's just a lot of editors who do not want to take any action. And hopefully that will change. Would you not say that it also uh, hurts the reputation of a journal? If there's a um, prestigious journal, mm -hmm. doesn't it hurt them as well if they publish a lot of uh, photoshopped uh, papers? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's different opinions on it. But um, in my opinion, a journal that shows uh, to have some courage and retracts or puts expression, um, uh, you know, uh, Like, like flags papers as probably uh, wrong, that actually shows that a journal has courage and that they're doing the right thing. I think for me, a journal that doesn't address these things is showing that they're not a good journal. But there's journals who would argue it the other way and they say, oh, but any retraction or any expression of concern is a, um, a dent in our reputation. But I think it's actually it's actually showing them that they're, they do care about science. So it's And I, I hope that that opinion is slowly changing. There have been people who have authors who have retracted their papers after finding an error in it, like an honest error, but like a big error that changed the results. And those authors retracted their papers and they actually have received a lot of positive comments about it. Like these are authors who really care about their papers. They retracted them themselves. And, uh, and now they're going to redo the the results and republish it and and that's that's awesome that's great that's how science should be a paper is not done once it's published it's not like yeah. you know written in stone well although i guess we're now we're living in 2020 and it's been a shitty year so far uh but you know we can all agree that science can change a little bit over time And that maybe a paper is not done once it's published. Like we can maybe move towards a system where a paper is sort of always morphing and always changing depending on comments of other people. And, and you know, that would be one of the, the things that people are discussing, that maybe we should go to preprints and then have them sort of peer reviewed and have like, I don't know, maybe after 20 peer reviews, you move to a next level or some something that is more like the review dynamic. comments sort of yeah. model. Yeah, yeah I, mean, exactly. I heard like yeah. of a, like a post publication peer review things or type of thing where people can just review a published paper already. Like I yeah. think there's like yeah. some structures. I mean, you should be able to write comments on a paper below where it's published because YouTube has a comment section, <laughs> and people, uh, YouTubers well, are also held to a certain standard. So, published yeah. scientific literature should also be. And some journals have that, but nobody looks at these things. Um, because I've left comments on uh, plus one papers, like that's how I did it in the beginning, but I didn't really post yet to Papier, and like nobody ever looked at these things, and and uh, I bet a lot of people would be very familiar with the plus one paper website, but have no idea where to look for the comments. Uh, I can tell you it's on the left, <laughs> sort of just <laughs> under the title. Okay, but, um, good to know. Exactly, but but like nobody looks at these things. So for me, I usually say um, Papier for me is the way to leave comments. And I recommend people install the Papier plugin. It will work with your browser. It will recognize papers, for example, in PubMed or any or Google Scholar and it will flag them. It will show you that there's a comment uh, on these papers. It can be a positive comment. It can be a negative comment. Uh, but it will show you that there have been some, some uh, there has been some discussion on this paper, and you can you can read it by clicking on the link. Yeah, so basically, awareness for the whole thing is like an important issue, and because people usually just care about the results, they just download the paper if possible, I guess with plus one, and, and just read through it instead of checking like everything that's around it. I mean, I have to admit, at least that's how I do it so right. far. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's how I did it too. But I'm, I'm now, of course, a very experienced Papier user. So I have the plugin. I, I use that a lot. But that's because, you know, I, I contribute a lot also to Papier. But uh, I think it's a simple way for others to, to just see if there has been any discussion. And some papers have very interesting discussions and, and author replies. And uh, you can learn a lot from those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so speaking of... Uh peer and publication the concept of peer review this re really so all the papers which are usually published are presumed to have undergone a strict peer review process <laughs> but 
it's, yeah. it's a presumption Presumed that we're... and strict. Yeah, those are presumptions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how do you think that? How do these papers, with so many misinformation, get across through peer review, and what can be done, even if it's not an open open access? What do you think is the way forward here? Um, uh, yeah. So going back to peer review, like peer review is usually just two or three people's opinions, and I've I've done many peer reviews myself. I'm very disappointed sometimes by what other people think is a peer review it's just basically i've seen peer reviews where people have like two or three lines summarizing the paper that's a good start and then just say this is a great paper done it's like no that's not a peer review like no matter what you can always find an error just find a missing comma um find um you know a reference to figure two where it should have been figure three um, maybe the citations are out of order. I mean, that's the usual errors that just happens uh, even in my papers because, you know, papers just shifting, you know, inserting an extra figure. There's always one place where you f forget to to change the figure numbering. And so there's always easy things, low-hanging fruit, that tells me that a reviewer has actually looked at the whole paper. Like, you, you can always find a small error. Of course, that's not really peer review, but it shows me that the peer reviewer has gone through the whole paper. Uh, but like, so most people don't really have anything critical to say. And I think we need a little bit more critical people and, and in a good way. I mean, it needs to be polite. It needs to be respectful, but you can always argue a little bit with a discussion point or, um, a, you know, a, a point they didn't consider in the paper, uh, some better way of graphing or showing the results. There's always something you can say about a paper so most peer reviews are very short mine are like i don't know five pages long and i but i always do it with intent to make it a better paper not to rip it apart i want to make it better and i say well you know if you choose slightly different colors here or you're maybe be a little bit more consistent in your naming and uh i have always lots of things to say so that's that's i think how peer review should be and it should be with intent to make it a better paper uh then, but it's only two or three people's opinion. Even if all two or three peer reviews are good, it's just it's still limited. Um, I think with with any science, scientists will make errors, but also will be biased. And peer review is supposed to add to that bias, uh, to to point out the bias, because we're all we all go into an experiment thinking we know what the outcome will be, and uh, then when we have the outcome, we'll I don't know, make a model or, or some hypothesis. But it's good to have other people's opinion and point out that there might be alternative hypothesis or al just alternative explanations so, for what we have found. So that is what peer review is about. But it's only two or three other people who do that. So I think post-peer review offers, you know, basically the whole world now can look at the paper and offer other perspectives. So that is good. Um, so, so, yeah, I think moving forward, having more openness in in what the peer reviewers had to say, not maybe necessarily reveal who the peer reviewers were, but what did they have to say about it is, is for me one thing that would open up a lot about uh, what people, you know, the opportunities that were missed and the editors who maybe made the wrong decision based on a very sloppy peer review, because editors have a big role there too. But also opening up a paper for peer review after publication would be... A good thing. So basically making the whole process of peer review more transparent, why people right. made certain decisions right. and so on. Okay. Um, do you also, uh, th so I'm not sure how this works with uh, publishers usually, but um, concerning, for example, images and also text, I thought uh, pub publishers would use some kind of software to detect the errors. Uh, do you know how this is being handled? Um, so... So uh, publishers or journals, it depends a little bit on the structure, will screen for textual similarities. So basically plagiarism. And, and though that's, that's relatively easy. Yeah? You can compare one particular part of the text to all other text ever published, you know, like doing a Google search. For images, it's much harder. But you cannot really detect errors just by an automatic screen because, you know, did the statistical method that they that the authors used is that was that the right method 
for that you need a statistical expertise person and uh that is not always the peer reviewer i've reviewed papers on microbiology and i'm like okay these statistics are way over my head and i usually will say i cannot really say anything about it but i hope somebody else can i hope one of the other reviewers maybe has something to say but if the other reviewer also has no idea maybe maybe the paper was using the wrong method and uh, or there was an error in it that i didn't catch and the other peer review didn't catch and the, so there's not a lot of screening for these things science is still based on trust and trusting other people's uh, results. And uh, we should maybe build in a little bit more scrutiny, not just to look for manipulation, but just errors or... Uh, uh, but yeah, data sets are becoming so big. It's like, I don't know, I, I usually, if I review a, a microbiome, microbiome paper, I don't download the 2 million sequences and redo the analysis myself. That's... Like, I don't even know how to download usually from these websites and do the bioinformatics. That would take me a year to check if all the results were real. So a lot of the peer reviews I do, I don't check for those things. I just sort of eyeball the results and think, well, that looks reasonable. Or, uh, But I've also actually did get a data set, not the sequences, but the interpreted data set. And, and it did not, I read it the analysis and it did not match their figure at all. Their figure looked beautiful and clean. And I was looking at the the table that was used to make the ordination plot, and it just didn't match. And um, so I redid the analysis and said, "Well, I don't, I don't believe these results because it looks very different when I do it. So I cannot, I, I don't trust this." And I wrote to the editor and I said, "I, I don't, I don't trust these results. I'm sorry, but." Uh, okay. So Did it, it get rejected. published in the end? No, it was rejected. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, so with that, we've come to the end of this first part of our discussion with Dr. Elizabeth Pick. We really hope you enjoyed it, and we're going to be back next Monday with the second part of the discussion with her. And uh, let us know about your thoughts on image manipulation and scientific misconduct through the email at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. And please feel free to send us any feedback, suggestions, or comments, or people who you'd like us to interview. We're very happy to hear from you. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is produced by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication and Magazine Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The series of podcast episodes are hosted by Srinath Ramkumar, Nikolai Horman, and Alison Lewis. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar and the pre intro jingle composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. We are currently available on YouTube with subtitles for those interested in that. And I will say cheers to all of you now and see you all next week. Until then, Stay safe and stay strong and stay healthy.